NCAA 2K20 on GA Sports is brought to you by Derek's NCAA 2020-2021 rosters. These are the most authentic college basketball rosters ever produced, featuring true-to-life player faces, ratings, and tendencies, as well as fully customized teams, coaches, and lineups. Check out the Patreon featured in the description so you can get the roster when it drops, plus monthly updates. Come be a part of the most ambitious project in sports gaming by clicking the link in the description. After 17 episodes of NCAA 2K20, we've seen it all. Every one of our 36 teams has had an opportunity to prove themselves. And now, as the all-important conference season looms, we bring you the final GAW rankings for NCAA 2K20. We begin, of course, at number 15 with the Virginia Cavaliers, whose two big wins against Pac-12 opponents and .484 strength of win-loss sneaks them just inside these rankings. Next, we have Gonzaga here, where they started the season 1-1 one and one, and then actually went 2-1 and one in non-conference play here um, to find themselves at the 14th position in our standings. One of the Pac-12 teams that Virginia beat in their conference tune-up was the Washington Huskies. And Washington will come in here at number 13. Now, they did have three losses in the uh, conference tune-up. But when you look at the teams that they lost to, all three of them being ranked, Seton Hall, Virginia, and Gonzaga. So Washington has had a tough run. And even though they dropped five spots from number eight that we had them in our last rankings, they still managed to crack the top 15. Absolutely. And then up next, we have um, the Minnesota Golden Gophers. They went up three places from 15 after just sneaking inside the rankings. They took a hard, hard loss here to Villanova early on, but bounced back against LSU and TCU. Coming in at number 11, it's the Florida Gators out of the SEC. Florida was not ranked in our last edition, but three very strong wins, including one win over CSU in their conference tune-up, got the Gators uh, close to the top 10, at least, in these rankings. Absolutely. And next up, we have those Kentucky Wildcats, also in the SEC here, uh, sporting a 6-3 and three record. Um, they are down three places despite going 2-1 and one in non-conference play, but that's because one of their losses was to you know, a major, major opponent here in Purdue, who we will see later on in the rankings. Well, why make you wait? Purdue is coming in at number nine. They, they are the highest team here of all the teams that weren't ranked in our last edition. And that is because, of course, of such a strong conference tune-up. Uh, began with a win over Kentucky, went on to have big wins over Florida State and Mississippi State. So Purdue really impressed us with what with what they could do and a fairly tough schedule during that time for the Boilermakers. Five and three is good enough to get Purdue ranked this high. And our and one of the big teams that is dropping out of the, the rankings here, or dropping down I should say, is the CSU Rams. They've dropped five places after going one and two in non-conference play here, losing to two really tough teams in Duke and Florida, but beating Arizona. So that has warranted a fall for the, the CSU Rams here. Well, from one of the biggest drops to the biggest jump, number seven is the Auburn Tigers out of the SEC. They've jumped four places on the back of five straight wins. And we didn't know that much about them when we got to our last rankings. But now looking back, wins over uh, ranked Washington and uh, adding wins adding wins as well over Arizona State and and uh, and Michigan State uh, that helps that helps Auburn get up here close to the top five the only thing that kept this five and one team out of the top five they are dead last in the country in strength of win loss at point three one nine. Next up, we have a non-Power 5 team in the Villanova Wildcats, sitting at 6-1 and one and up three places from last from our last rankings. Uh, Villanova, they didn't really have a tough schedule in non-conference play, but the fact that they won three straight games, putting them to that 6-1 and one mark, um, warranted us to move them up here in the rankings. Starting off the top five here, North Carolina, the Tar Heels coming in at 5-1. and one. Now, they remain at number five. They were undefeated 
uh, by the time our last rankings came around, of course they were coming off an 11 point win over UCLA in the CBS Sports Classic, started their conference tune-up schedule with uh, an upset loss at Oregon, but followed up with two really solid wins, a, th a 37 point victory over KU, and then a double digit win over LSU. North Carolina has really impressed us all the way around and they've played a fairly tough schedule as well. So the Tar Heels just sneak into the top five. Coming in at number four and up two places from our last ranking, you guessed it, the Seton Hall Pirates of the non-Power 5 Conference. They are sitting at 7-1 and one here and have been on a seven-game winning streak, only losing their opener of the season to UNC, um, who just sit right behind them here in the standings. They had commanding wins over Washington, Maryland, and then a close game against Syracuse where they won on a last-second shot. Coming in at number three is the Texas Tech Red Raiders, the highest ranked team from the Big 12. Sorry, spoilers for that one. Texas Tech is maybe the hottest team in the country. After a massive loss to USC in their first conference tournament, they've had two wins over Kentucky, a win over Minnesota, and then wins over Oregon and Houston. Texas Tech has looked fantastic throughout their run here. And so while, you know, they, they still have one loss, so they're not able to, to quite crack the top two, the Red Raiders have impressed the hell out of us with everything that they've been able to do this season. Look out for them in the Big 12. Absolutely, and coming in at number two, it is the undefeated Duke Blue Devils, who stayed hot, beat Colorado State pretty commandingly in non-conference play. Um, while also beating Ohio State by 41 points. Yes, you heard that correct. 41 points there. Um, and then getting a 19-point win over UCLA. Um, they have a really, really fairly solid strength of win-loss at coming in at .454. Um, but being undefeated, they have finished in the top two of our rankings. And so that leaves us with number one and remaining in that top spot for the second rankings in a row is the Memphis Tigers. Now, Duke has really impressed us with everything that they've done, maybe more so than Memphis because Memphis did not play a very tough conference tune-up schedule, but how could you unseat the Tigers? I mean, I think I think Adam said it best when we were when we were discussing our final rankings, you can only beat the teams that are in front of you, and Memphis has certainly done that in emphatic fashion with 20 plus point wins over Michigan and Kansas State. Memphis has been possibly the most dominant team we've seen uh, in NCAA 2K20 since we started. Their signature win over Villanova shows that these Tigers are for real. And now, coming up next, a special as we move on very, very close now to the conference season, we will have our short list for our player of the year, position of the year rankings. So you won't want to miss that. That's coming up next. It's time to talk individual awards here in NCAA 2K20, and this is the only specific episode where we're, where we're going to talk about these at length. So these short lists that we're going to bring you right now as the players in the lead for all of these awards, these mean a lot because you're not going to see this again until we finally hand the awards out at the end of the season. So as we build up towards the National Player of the Year discussion, let's begin with talking about our point guard of the year. And this is not the last time you're going to see this name, but you better know who he is. Trey Jones, the stellar sophomore from Duke. He is absolutely dominating every point guard in his position. He's the nation's leading scorer at 23.6 points a game, adding 5.7 assists. What more can you say about this kid's contribution to the number two team in the country? Not really much more other than the fact that he is number one among point guards um, in PER, efficiency, and um, get game scoring, you know, so as you already mentioned, so he is just the all-around package here for Duke. I think he's the driving force for them. Um, in the few times that we've seen Duke, he's really, you know, when they've been in slumps, he's really the one to get them going. So um, the key to Duke's success, and I guess the key to stopping Duke as well, is to stop this man, Trey Jones. Yep, you are absolutely right. One guy to just keep an eye on, Anthony Cohen down there. We have him second. He is the leader in the country in assists right now at 6.6 .6 per game. 
Let's move on to the shooting guard of the year. And similarly to Trey Jones, the man in first seems to be running the show. And it's a guy that maybe we haven't done enough justice to talking about. It's Jared Roden from Seton Hall. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have done enough justice. As you can see, Chris Clark is number two on our list, but the main man, Jared Roden here, and I'm a big proponent for uh, Seton Hall, along with Texas Tech, but with Seton Hall as well. And He's, you know, kind of been a, a quiet name that's really kept the, the clog ticking there, um, you know, averaging 18 yep. points, about three boards, two assists, and a steal per game, all as a shooting guard. It's insane. Um, like yep. you said, similar to Trey Jones, is first in all shooting guards and PER efficiency at game scoring, but also in usage too, which means that, you know, Seton Hall is getting good, good use out of this man, Jared Roden. Yeah, absolutely. You can see if he's first among shooting guards in usage and efficiency, he is being leaned on a lot to provide scoring for that team. And they do it for good reason because he is doing it more efficiently than anybody else. So he certainly absolutely. is the leader in the clubhouse for that. Let's move on to the small forward of the year, and this is a position group that has not gotten a lot of love. Xavier Sneed right now in the lead, but there's one guy that we really want to talk about. It's the freshman from Memphis, Precious Achua, averaging just under 11 points a game, but this kid is somebody that even as a freshman, Memphis is turning to when they need him, and not only is he a stat sheet filler, but 27.7 usage rate is third among small forwards. And you look at the veterans that are on this list, whether it's Sneed, Thistlewood, Swider. I mean, this kid is being treated as if he were a fifth year senior. Yeah, absolutely. And there's high praise and that's why we've kind of bumped him up. Um, he, did, he does have the most boards out of all small forwards, so we will say that as well. Um, you know, points may not be there, but you know what? If you're averaging 11 points and seven boards per game, you're definitely going to have an effect. And again, he's one of the you know freshmen that's a driving force for this Memphis team, a reason why they are 9-0. and <laughs> You are absolutely right about that. A core of freshmen over at Memphis, and Achua is one of the most important ones. We'll get, of course, to the other one who makes headlines just in a little bit. But we take a stop off at Power Forward of the Year, and uh, is it possible to call this thing right now? I mean, is there a mercy rule for this? When you look at <laughs> EJ Montgomery and how good he's been this season, there's no one maybe in any position, but certainly not any power forward in the country that can compare to what EJ Montgomery has done this season. Yeah, it, it's without a doubt question. I mean, the man's averaging a double-double, and he's doing it in style as well. He's dropping about 22 points a game with 11 boards as well while getting in almost two two steals and two blocks as well like EJ's all over the place he's not only offensively insane but defensively he's good too and we'll definitely get into that later as well yeah absolutely it should not it should be noted that he has made a huge impact defensively and as you say we will get to that uh, let's get to center of the year. Maybe the most stacked position group that we have in NCAA 2K20 in terms of the uh, impacts that these guys have had on games. And so the top three here, Vernon Carey, Udoka Azubuki, and James Weissman, we'll get to these guys all later. I'm sure you know what we mean by that. But I want to talk about the two guys at number four and five on this list because these are two guys that don't get the same recognition as those top three but matt harms from purdue we'll start with him averaging 14 and a half a game 12 boards adds a uh, over a block per game i mean this guy for a purdue team that's really come out of nowhere as of late he's made a huge impact yeah he really has been he's just a force whenever he plays we see it um good to see he's getting the recognition he deserves here but yeah matt harms from purdue is a name to i think to watch out for on this list here yeah absolutely and the other name that we want to talk about killian tilly from gonzaga and gonzaga another team that's really come on as of late and uh, got themselves ranked after really not showing us a ton uh, in our first edition of rankings and Tilly as well. He is one of the better scorers as centers are concerned averaging about 15 a game adds eight boards and two assists as well. So this is a guy that has some versatility. He can play the four or the five and again a guy that's really leading a Gonzaga team that's coming on strong here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean Tilly what can you say? I mean, the, the two assists, I think he's only behind Vernon Carey on that in terms of assists for, for center. So 
like Carey, Tilly's correct. a bit of a playmaker. So yeah, I, I, I want to say you know hats off to him. He's not only getting things done on the on the boards in the paint scoring, but also he's you know providing his team with a little extra a few points and good dishes in the paint there. Yep, yep, absolutely. Move on to defensive player of the year, and we mentioned that you'd be hearing from EJ Montgomery again. Uh, I hate to spoil, this isn't the last. He right now is in first uh, in terms of Defensive Player of the Year dis uh, discussion for everything that we've mentioned. But let's talk about the man who's in second, Brandon Newman from Purdue. Now, this guy has gotten almost no recognition when we've when we've seen Purdue throughout this series because offensively, that's not what they lean on him for. But defensively, this man's contributions should not be overlooked. And when you look at these gaudy numbers here, uh, opponents are shooting just 20% when guarded by Brandon Newman. He's averaging just three and a half points per game against. This guy is the real deal when it comes to perimeter defense, and not everyone really knows who he is, and that's kind of our fault, but you should get to know this man. Absolutely, and we'll say in addition to that that all these players on the defensive player list, they have to average 12 minutes per game. Um, that's 12 minutes in our sim time of what we do in our yep. game. So it's about 75% of the game. They have to average average minutes there, which is, you know, very impressive for these for these guys here. Um, so Brandon Newman, definitely one of the names. Another one is Alejan Demir. You know, he's another center. I think he came up just short outside of that center of the year at the moment. But defensively, you can't get by him. He's one of the best centers in the country defensively um, with stats like this. Like, you know, he is grabbing about six boards defensively per game. You know, having having almost steal a game, almost averaging three blocks per game, which just goes to show. And with an opponent field goal percentage of .298, you know, less than, less than .3 there, you know, man's man's nearly unstoppable, and a huge reason why Minnesota is where they are. I think is defensively they've been so good, and it stems from. Yes, I I can agree with that. And we move on to freshman of the year. We get ever closer to this all important player of the year discussion, which we're gonna have a lot of fun with. Freshman of the year, uh, you can imagine right now, Vernon Carey leads the way. James Wiseman not far behind. But since we just discussed our Defensive Player of the Year rankings, here's another guy that showed up on that list that we want to talk more about right now, Cole Anthony from North Carolina. Here's the thing about Cole Anthony and why he makes it into this Freshman of the Year discussion. Averaging just 10 points a game, 3 rebounds, 5 assists. Look, it's a good stat line. Is it top 5 player in the country that kind of jumps off the page to you? Not necessarily, but here's the thing about Cole Anthony. He has been so good defensively. He has been counted on to lock down opposing perimeter players. And North Carolina is the best defensive team in the country. Cole Anthony is the leader of that team, and he's a freshman. I mean, that's crazy to think about. <laughs> yeah, you hit the nail on the head right there the, um, right there with that. And, you know, he, he's been really just locked down. And I think, you know, like you said, to be a freshman point guard, but to be ever so locked down, especially with the schedule that UNC has had to start the year as well, I mean, like, they've had to play the likes of Seton Hall, Gonzaga, yep. UCLA, you know, KU, LSU, Oregon. Those are all the teams that they've played. You look at some of those yep. teams, some of those teams have some insane point guards on them. So you have to, you oh, just absolutely. have to look at that and say, you know, hats off to Cole Anthony there. Absolutely. I mean, when you, when you can add guys like Miles Powell, Tiger Campbell, Skylar Mays, when you can add all these guys, Peyton Pritchard, add them all to the list of guys that Cole Anthony has shut down when North Carolina has played these teams, that says a lot about Anthony's contribution. And again, just a freshman. This kid's 18 years old. It's really unbelievable to think about. We move on to our penultimate award here that we're going to give you the short list. It's Coach of the Year. And, of course, the two names at the top, uh, Penny Hardaway, New to coaching college, certainly will be no stranger going forward to this list with how good Memphis has been. Mike Krzyzewski, he's won this award more times than I've gone to sleep, so uh, yeah, he, he's he's all right here. Uh, but one guy that we really want to talk about is that guy sitting at number five, Nico Medved from CSU. Even though the Rams faltered a little bit in their uh, conference tune-up games going one and two, Medved is still leading this team out of nowhere to be a top 10 team 
in the country. Played a fairly tough schedule as well with a point four three five strength of win loss. I mean, this team has come out of nowhere, and Medved is a big reason why. Yeah, they just play really good team ball. Medved brings a big family culture to the team. I think that's really helped them, you know, start off seven and zero, but now be eight and two um, with a really nice signature win over Michigan as well. So, I think that's really just helped propel this team forward and. It's gonna be exciting. I mean, you look at you look at some of these coaches here in the Coach of the Year candidate. I mean, Memphis. You have a uh, Seton Hall, Kevin Willard. Both are non-power five teams, so it'll be the, the determining factor for the CC team. And if Medved can move up in this Coach of the Year standings, is if they can compete and play well and finish strong in their non-power five conference. You are absolutely right about that. And now we get to the discussion that I'm sure everyone was waiting for. Let's talk about player of the year. And leading the list right now at number one is EJ Montgomery from Kentucky. He was the leading, the nation's leading scorer for almost the entire non-conference season. Trey Jones ended up passing him right at the end. So now Trey Jones is the nation's leading scorer. But EJ Montgomery, when you look at his entire body of work, averaging a double-double, Adds one and a half steals, 2.2 blocks. He is right now, according to us, the best defensive player in the country, as well as bringing all of his contributions offensively. How can you not put him at number one in player of the year right now? But this race is exceptionally close with two guys from Duke hot on Montgomery's tail. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's a reason there's two guys up there for Duke is because they are still the driving forces for them in Trey Jones and Vernon Carey. I mean, Vernon Carey's been not only averaging a double-double and doing it in style, but he is also still defensively sound, like we said, Trey Jones. It's very sound for all point guards in the nation. When you have two players like that that are leading a team that's 7-0, and I mean, you, you know, what can you do there? Um, but then followed by Azabuki, you know, which is a name that obviously as a center, you know, a lot of people see and recognize and know. Um, was a little injured, so maybe he's not as high as he should be. Um, he was out one or two games there with an injury. But look, he's still putting in a baller stat line here. He's still a force of nature on the court. I think he gets to full strength. He has a really good um, conference season. You know, I think he really yep. he really pushes for it here. So. Yeah, I agree. And and coming up just behind Azubuki is a guy that, again, we it's our fault. We haven't given him enough love. But Jared Roden from Seton Hall, We've been so impressed by the Pirates and, and what they've done and going forward what we expect them to do, even in a in a really, really difficult non-Power 5 conference. And Jared Roden, like we mentioned, when you are first among the entire country in your position in usage and in efficiency, Seton Hall is leaning on this guy to lead them forward. And Roden is doing it, and he's doing it efficiently. And that kind of thing... It, it, it can't go ignored what Roden has done for this great Seton Hall team. So look for him to to maybe charge up this list if he continues to make the plays and, and have the kind of contributions that he's been having to a top five team in Seton Hall. And coming up right behind him is the stellar freshman out of Memphis, James Weissman. He had such a hot start to the season, and he's cooled off slightly. I mean, the dude's still averaging 17.7 and a half boards and two blocks a game. So... I mean, I don't know. I don't know if "cool off" is the right is the right phrase, but but man, James Weissman as a freshman, this this guy is unbelievable. What he's done for Memphis, and just like you say, with Jones and Carey for Duke, the combination of Precious Achua and James Weissman for Memphis, that's a big reason why Memphis is number one. They have a lot of depth, but those two guys are leading the charge, and Weissman at times has looked, you know, Shaq in 1997. I mean, he's looked unstoppable. <laughs> No, you're spot on with that. And that's great, great analogy there with Shaq coming into play. Uh, moving on to seven here, where we have rank seven is Chris Clark, who I've heard Griff, you've said he's probably the best pure shooter in the entire game that we have, or from what you've seen at least. And I mean, he's number seven for a reason in player of the year because he does just knock down shot after shot after shot. He's not really a yep. stat line stuffer, but in terms of scoring, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think going into conference play, given how Texas Tech has done, given how the rest of the conference has done, probably one of our weaker conferences we can say right now um, that, we can, that we can see or how it's played out to be. Not saying those teams are bad by any means, just saying right. it's played out. I think 
you know, this man could honestly, he could get that scoring up a little bit, and I think we might see him rise into maybe um, score, have the best scoring in the nation by the end of the season. I think it'll be interesting, but I agree, best pure shooter for me as well. Um, it'll be interesting to see what he can do. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree with you. I have, in the past, you're absolutely right. I've called him the best pure shooter, the best pure scorer in the country right now, just in terms of how it seems how easily he can score the basketball. And you're absolutely right. They're in the Big 12 right now, um, there does seem to be opportunity for Chris Clark to have some big games against defenses that are struggling. Uh, we may see him rise in this list. And we end here with Anthony Cohen Jr. from Maryland, a guy that we mentioned when it comes to point guard of the year, overshadowed by Trey Jones in that position. But look, point guards are relied upon to get offenses going. They are the quarterbacks of offenses in the game of basketball. And Anthony Cohen right now does that better than anyone in the country. 6.6 .6 assists per game, 15.3 uh, efficiency, which is third among all point guards. How can you not recognize this guy's contributions? Even though Maryland hasn't had the start to the season that they would have wanted, Anthony Cohen still needs to be recognized as one of the premier point guards in the country. And we are going to recognize him here. And that is it for us. Right now, conference season is coming up. We're going to take a week off here to get you guys primed. And then we are all in on the most important conference season you have ever seen. Remember, there's no conference tournament. The top two teams from each conference are going to the NCAA tournament. So every game means everything for every team. You will not want to miss it. It is going to start next week. So subscribe so you can see that. We appreciate it.